Well, welcome, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests and friends. Welcome to this morning's important event uh, that will focus on cooperation between Vietnam and Scotland. It's a particular pleasure to welcome His Excellency Mr. Soon, Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Vietnam, and His Excellency the Ambassador to the United Kingdom. We're also, as I say, grateful to the Business School of the University of Edinburgh, not just for this event, but for enabling us to come here often. Today's presentation and discussion are central to the mission of the Asia Scotland Institute, which is to promote awareness and understanding and collaboration between Scotland and the countries of Asia to create mutually enriching economic, cultural and educational opportunities, thereby enabling the people of Scotland to engage effectively with the people of Asia for a shared future. Founded two years ago, we also aim to equip tomorrow's leaders with the knowledge and skills to engage with Asia in the manner that many of their forebears did over the centuries. Looking at the UK and Vietnam and opportunities for Scotland, this morning we will be exploring how Scottish companies and institutions can do business and engage more fully with Vietnam and demonstrate Scotland's interest in strengthening ties with that country. And in that respect, there are some very significant and important British companies in the room today who I know are doing business in Vietnam, planning to do business in Vietnam, uh, and have contacts there. Uh, as, as part of the ASEAN group of uh, nations, Vietnam will participate next year in the creation uh, of one of the world's largest integrated markets with 10 states and a population of over 600 million under the motto, one vision, one identity, and one community. And indeed, last month, senior representatives of the group visited Edinburgh and the Asia Scotland Institute helped to host them. <coughs> Links with the UK have been growing there and it is over 40 years ago that formal diplomatic relations were established. There have been recently some key events, which I'll just point out to you uh, as well. In October of last year, the third UK-Vietnam strategic dialogue was held focusing on cooperation in defence and security the prevention of international organised crime and public security. And in April of this year, the UK-Vietnam Agreement fostering cooperation in economic activity, trade and investment was signed. Since 1986, Vietnam's Doi Moi or Economic Renovation Programme has resulted in the country's economy growing by an average of 7% per annum, as will be heard, and opportunities for foreign investment in the areas of financial services, tourism, infrastructure, production and manufacturing, and in particular, the electronic sector, where companies such as Intel and Foxconn are already fully engaged. So this is a young and vibrant country where over half of the population are aged less than 25. And perhaps consequently, internet usage in Vietnam is far higher than in countries of an equivalent size. In short, in the next hour or so, we will learn of some of the opportunities for Scottish-based companies, some of which are represented here, as I've mentioned, for our great universities in the field of education and other institutions. We will also hear, no doubt, of some of the current geopolitical challenges and tensions, for example, recently with China, as the Vice Minister and his colleagues share their thoughts with us. Very good morning to uh, all of you. Good and thank you very much for uh, the invitation from uh, the Business School of, uh, and the University of Scotland and also the Institute of uh, Scotland, Asia Institute of Scotland that invites me to uh, these uh, special occasions to have interaction, brief and uh, direct interactions with uh, all of you here today. I think uh, the time for me is uh, around uh, one hour for all, um, I mean, introduction as well as the uh, interactions between us. So I think uh, we have also prepared a very uh, good uh, speech here, but I don't think that I would uh, use all the time for that. <laughs> hmm. I just uh, say brief with you uh, three issues. Uh, first, I have to uh, thank the British, the Scottish, uh, people and country that uh, brings the sunshine for me. Uh, 
<laughs> when I came here, <laughs> I came here on the uh, evening of Saturday. It was raining very hot, and I thought, "It's uh, my God, it's a problem." On uh, Monday, when it rains here, it would be a problem. But my ambassador and uh, all the staff said that even if it's raining heavily, no problem because the people would come to the meeting and the conference. So I was satisfied. But again, yesterday and today it turned out very sunny. Thank you very much for that. It also the, uh, shows the warmness of our relationship between Asia and uh, Europe, between Vietnam and UK and the Scottish people. I think this is the time that uh, we look at both continents in a different perspective. Uh, a few days ago, I was at the summit meeting of the Asia-Europe meeting in Ireland. And I said to the audiences that uh, Europe and Asia are two cradles of civilizations. We have long been uh, developed and going on very fast. But at this turn of the century and also at the turn of this time, uh, we can look at uh, both continents in a different perspective. One is that Europe is continue its integration to solve the problems. And I think and my belief is that Europe continue to strengthen is uh, unity and continue to move forward. Asia, during the time of crisis, uh, Asia has gone very fast and became the center of the world economy with many different uh, big countries or rising countries we call BRICS, like China, India, Russia, etc. But again, the community of Southeast Asian of 10 countries, as Rodney said, would become the reality, would become reality by the end of next year, 2015, with a realization of uh, 600 million people, uh, GDP of around 2.4 trillion US dollars, and the huge markets when the zero, uh, uh, tariff has brought down to uh, zero by the end of next year. So I think this is the big time for us to look at different. For us, I think the UK and Vietnam, we, I think we would, I would talk, update you on two issues. One is the developments in Vietnam recently, and the other is our bilateral relations and how businesses can can take the opportunities to work in Vietnam, to work in Asia, to work in ASEAN. Uh, the first is the developments in Vietnam, I say very briefly, as uh, Rodney has said, in the past 30 years or so, next year would uh, sum up the 30 years of renovation. And looking back, in the past 30 years, the average growth of the GDP of Vietnam was around 7% annually. In the last three to five years, even though facing with the difficulties of the world economy, the growth rate continued to be sustained at around 5 to 6%. Last year, it was 5.4%. And this year, we uh, uh, forecast that it would be around 5.8 to 6 percent this year. So the recovery is coming back. Uh, we could sustain the macroeconomic stability uh, with the international reserves coming up, conti continue to build up, uh, the same as other Asian economies. Uh, the number of tourists coming to Vietnam increased around 15 to 25 percent annually, depends. But last year, uh, it registered at around 5.7 billion people coming to Vietnam internationally. But of course, this adds to the domestic tourists of around 30 million people going around to the country. is also a very big source of, of uh, opportunities for foreign investors to build up the services industry 
for domestic uh, or people, Vietnamese people, uh, tourists itself as well. Uh, that's looking back. Uh, so what we are doing now and what we are going to, uh, to do in the coming years. Currently, we focus on two issues. One is to restructure our economy. After 30 years with average growth like that, but we think that it's now time for us to change the mode of, of uh, uh, development. So both restructuring the economy and change the mode of development would be going at the same time. On restructuring of the economy, we focus on three main areas. One is the restructure of the banking system, especially the commercial banks. The second is to focus on public investments to increase the efficiency of the public investments. That's very important for us. And also, uh, along with that, we also have to increase the thrifty of the economy because people with the growth rate quite high, people spending too lavishly in the past 30 years. Now we have to change the mode. On, uh, uh, mode of development to change the mode we would change from the extensive we call development to more intensive and increase the productivity of the economy uh, in the same pattern or trend that uh, UK and other countries are, are working now is that from a more uh, I mean energy consumption industries to more efficiency or less energy used economies to develop in the future. So I think this is, the, in the long term, what we look at three areas of, of, of focus. One is to focus on infrastructure development. This is one of the areas that we consider as the bottlenecks if we want to overcome the middle income uh, traps. So this is the area that we would, would focus on. Infrastructure here means both hard, uh, uh, hardware uh, in, uh, infrastructure, including uh, land roads, uh, railway system, uh, energy sector, etc. And also hardware infrastructure uh, and uh, software infrastructure, including the IT industry and creative some of us I met here, business here, creative industries, that high-tech industries that we would move into to increase our productivity. That's the second. The third is to focus on, uh, the second is to focus on the building up the perfect market uh, uh, economy status as well as the mechanism, market economy mechanism. As you know, we transformed the centrally planned economy to the market economy. In the last 30 years, we have done a lot. But again, this is a time that we have to learn from you, from other friends, to build up, to perfect the market functioning of the market system. And that's why we work with the EU, we work with the US, we work with others to, to, to perfect our market functioning, etc. The third areas we are focusing on is the education and, and human resource development that we need for modernization of the economy. So that's why it's opened up the huge opportunities for all the others to come to us, to assist us by joining ventures to set up educational facilities in, Hano, in Vietnam and also by sending our students to other countries for training education. For example, the number of our students in UK now is around uh, 10,000 students. In Scotland here, I heard only a few hundreds, but I think it's spread all around uh, UK. In uh, Australia, we have 25,000. In the US, we have 15 to 16,000 students. I mean, it's spreading. We are sending out, but we want more of you to come to us to do business and to open up. Uh, recently, last year, when we set up the strategic, uh, strategic partnerships, we also have one big project 
between Vietnam and UK. That is to set up the Vietnam UK University in Da Nang, in the central part of Vietnam. That's also a very good beginning. So I think this is the three areas for long-term areas, uh, our focus. And the, this would be uh, solving and moving us forward to achieve the goal of uh, a, a deindustrialized countries sometime by, by 2020 or 20, 25 or so. You try to move up the ladder of development. In the last 20 years, or 30 years, we have moved up from the least developed countries to middle-income countries. Now we continue to want to move up. That's the first issue I have to update you. The second issue is on international integration. Uh, the process of Vietnam's development is uh, closely linked between domestic reforms and international openness and integration. Uh, we cannot have this status without international support and assistance. UK each year has offered us around 50 million US dollars, uh, uh, 100 uh, million US dollars in uh, official development aid, other countries also. But more than that is FDI is coming from different countries. So we recognize that interne international integration is an uh, inseparate part of our, uh, I mean, development in the future. So that's why currently we are focusing on three areas. One is that bilaterally, we are now deepening our relationship with all countries. Because in the past 30 years, we have established uh, diplomatic relations with uh, 184 countries out of 192 countries in the UN. And now we want to deepen our relations with each of the countries. So in the last two years or so, we are focusing on developing our strategic or comprehensive partnerships with the different countries. With the EU, we have five strategic partnerships. One of that is UK. The other would be uh, Spain, uh, e Italy, uh, and uh, Germany. Mm. So, so I think this is the stretching. With others, we have also comprehensive partnership with the United States. And in Asia, of course, we have a strategic partnership. The total number of strategic partnerships we have, all countries, is now 15, one five and comprehensive partnerships with one, uh, 12 countries, one, two, and other types of frameworks of cooperation with all countries. Second is that uh, we integrate deeply more into ASEAN. As I said to you earlier, that we committed to build up ASEAN community, and we would contribute to that process because, as you know, the developments of ASEAN itself is not easy. Not easy because of the solidarity of the internal situation of each of the countries. It's different. So, for example, Thailand is now has a problem. Previously, Myanmar also has a problem. So now I think we have to work together <coughs> to strengthen the solidarity and move ASEAN to complete the vision of ASEAN community by 2015. Looking back, we have uh, revised and then last year at the summit of ASEAN leaders uh, in uh, 2013, 85% of the work for ASEAN economic community has been completed. So I think 15 more, 15 more percent would be completed by within one and a half years. It's not easy because the most difficult part will be now left. Uh, in social and uh, cultural affairs, uh, economic, uh, social and cultural community, uh, it's more than that. 90% of the uh, issues have been completed. So I think hopefully an ASEAN community, as Roddy said, 
of identity, of common identity, etc., would be coming up by 2015. ASEAN political and security community would be also set, aimed at 2015, but I think it would be somewhat later. Uh, so, so this is the process. But again, we have to work for that. Because if we can realize ASEAN community, the uh, advantage and the voices of each of the member countries would be increased vis-a-vis -vis international partners. Uh, the third direction of our policy is not bilaterally and now with ASEAN and now we also have uh, integration in all international institutions, including APEC, uh, ASEM summit meeting and at the United Nations. Currently, we are now a member of the Human Rights uh, Council of the UN also. And 2008-2010, uh, we are also member of the uh, non-permanent member of the Security Council. So I think we are now aimed to uh, participate in the, as a non-member of the uh, Security Council by 2020 and 21 again and seek the support of international uh, countries. Uh, one other aspect of our foreign policy is also to increase the network of FTA free trade areas with countries. Currently, we have signed eight uh, FTA with eight group of countries, or for example, within ASEAN and ASEAN Plus. ASEAN with China, ASEAN with New Zealand, with Australia, with Japan, with India, etc. We are, we are also a member of that. But again, we also now this uh, negotiating six other FTAs. Among them, three are very important. That is the first, the free trade area with the EU, which we have completed seven rounds of negotiations already. And uh, another round would be starting in, uh, by the end of this month, uh, June, in uh, Brussels. And we think both sides have determination to complete it by the time of the ASEAN summit in October this year in Milan, Italy. So I think this is a very important part. Second is the FTA, that is the TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, including tram member uh, economies, including the United States uh, and Vietnam. The process of negotiations here is uh, near the end already. And uh, it's supposed that uh, the process would be and uh, negotiations would completed by the end of 2014 also. And I think if that happens, the markets for Vietnam to all major economies would be open up. The third is that the regional comprehensive economic partnerships, we call ASEP, that includes uh, 10 ASEAN economies and six are the big economies in, uh, in uh, Asia, Pacific, including China, uh, Japan, uh, South Korea, Australia, India, and New Zealand. I think this is also 10 plus 6. Uh, I think this is also, if we can complete all these FTA by the end of this, of this year, then we would have around 55 partners with uh, with uh, tariffs, uh, I mean, coming down to uh, roughly zero by the end of next year, uh, 2015, if it comes into power. So that's uh, the first issue. The second is that now I brief just only the UK-Vietnam relations and uh, how we can explore from that. Uh, we, Vietnam, UK, we established diplomatic relations since 1973. Last year, we celebrated 40th anniversary of our bilateral relations already. In 2010, we established the strategic partnership agreements between the two. I can say that um, the relationship between Vietnam and UK have been broadened and deepened in all areas. But focusing, I think, on main three areas that you have very uh, competitive 
edge over others in working with Vietnam. One is that uh, in services sectors, especially fin financial and banking uh, sectors, and you have presence over there, you have HSBC, you have Standard Chartered Bank over there, so working very effectively. But still we need more. The second is that is education. Education, I think Vietnamese are looking at UK, uh, British and Scottish here, as you have very good educational system. Uh, that we can benefit. So as I said to you, the number of Vietnamese students coming to UK is coming, booming. The third is that uh, the area of uh, high technology uh, industry. So a lot of industry are now coming to Vietnam, including Rolls Royce, etc. are coming. I think this is the area that we, we need to focus on. But other than that, we have a whole range of areas of cooperation that provided in our strategic partnership agreements. Number one is politics and diplomacy. We have increased the exchanges of high level visits in the past years. But one of the areas that I work with my counterpart here, Mr. Hugo Swai, uh, Minister of State here at the Ministry, uh, at the uh, Foreign Office here, that we should encourage more uh, British leaders to come to Vietnam. So far, all the other major countries have uh, sent their leaders to Vietnam already, including the United States, twice already. But UK uh, Prime Minister, not yet. <laughs> not yet. So we are looking forward to, to work on that, including to get the support from the business community here. This is very good in the sense that it creates the opportunities for businesses to match, to work together, explore the areas of cooperation. On uh, global and regional issues, we can also cooperate, including supporting each other position. And we highly appreciate UK uh, positions recently, vis-à-vis uh, -vis the placement uh, of uh, Chinese uh, Eric in uh, deep into our continental shelf and the uh, exclusive economic zone of Vietnam. EU immediately uh, on the 2nd of May when China placed the Eric over there, we is a violation of the international law, violation of our sovereignty, violation of the jurisdiction the direction of right of Vietnam, and we raised our voices against this one. Our position is that we would work it peacefully with China to solve the issue based on international law and the law of the sea, 1982. Refrain from all major, uh, all the military threats or the use of force to solve the issue. And on the 8th of May, uh, the spokesperson of the Lady Ashton also announced the position of EU already, and two days later, UK also voiced the support of the positions by EU. So I think this is the case that we raise the voices, cooperate with each other to work on the basis of international law and, and the principles of international law. I think this is a good case of cooperation. Uh, Lady Ashton also called our Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs. I also make a call to Hugo Swai and we exchange, update each other on the situation very well. On trade investments and other areas of cooperation, I think people uh, exchange and including uh, uh, security and defense cooperation are booming and going very well. So I think this is the areas that we can look at and explore the opportunities to further cooperate between our two countries. Uh, so what we can do, from that, I think, for the part of the governments and our embassies here, we would create all the favorable conditions for you to come to Vietnam and vice versa. B Vietnamese businesses or people can come easily to the UK 
for exchanges, for exploring the opportunities for cooperations. As I said to you at the beginning, now we have to change the perspectives where we look at each other. Uh, so now we increased cooperation would bring both benefits to all of us and also contribute to peace and stability as well. Uh, the second is that uh, please look at all the areas that we are now carrying out internal reforms. As I said to you, restructuring the economy, uh, including the state-owned enterprises, the banking systems, etc., to 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 uh, explore the opportunities for investments, for cooperation with us, uh, and also. Uh, you can look at new areas that we are opening up the network of cooperation with other countries. When you go to Vietnam in the future, you can go to other 55 economies all over the world. So that is the, the issue that we can explore to do. I think uh, I use that's enough time to have an overview of the situation and uh, I'm ready to have interactions with all you, that's much better than listen to me. Mm. Thank, Thank you. you very much. In many Asian countries, the challenge of how to engage with young people and give them hope for the future mm. is, is hugely important. I'm thinking of India, for example, and mm. their recent elections and the challenges in Thailand. What, what is the government doing to engage young people and give them uh, hope for the future mm. and to engage them with your economy? Uh, as you said at the beginning, uh, the population in Vietnam is uh, the young population, we call the young population. If you uh, go to Vietnam, Asia, the atmosphere is completely different with here in the UK, Edinburgh here. because. People are going out into the streets very crowdedly, rush every day since three more in the morning until very late in the evening. Working, working, I don't know how the productivity is so low or, or, or some problem with that, but people are very hard working to, to, to see that. So what we can do, we look at the young people as a source of, of our de development currently and the future as well. Uh, during our process of renovation, we also focus on two areas to uh, help the young generations to take the uh, lead in our development in the future. One is even the economy is very uh, at the low level of development. We invest a lot into education. Uh, roughly, I can be very proud that even a poor uh, country and economy, around 96% of our population is, uh, is uh, literate. Uh, so I think uh, people have all, all opportunities for education. What I said to you is that we now have to focus more on the uh, quality of education, especially uh, higher education, including uh, vocational training schools at the levels to provide enough uh, workforce for different uh, manufacturing sites. The second is the management skills, etc. for upper, uh, or I can say the uh, um, university levels mm -hmm. up. Uh, for students, so we are very willing to send students out. The government also use a large portion of the money to provide scholarships for us, of course small, but we get the support for, from international uh, communities to, to help us. For example, UK also providing a lot of scholarships for us each year. But again, that's one. The other is that we have uh, uh, all the, I mean, uh, provide all the atmosphere or environments for students, for young people to participate in. Recently, we also have to mobilize young people to send to remote areas, different remote areas. And uh, at first, 
it was we imagined that it may be difficult because young people want to live in the urban areas. But when we the government mobilized the support and all the young are now a lot of I mean volunteer to come to remote areas to help people uh, in in a certain period of time from one three years. So that can interact with people, local people. This is a good time for us. Good morning. Yes. Um, my name is Elizabeth Mann. Um, I work for international financing institutions on safeguards, particularly issues like land acquisition, compensation, mm. issues like that. Um, to what extent does the ministry and uh, the Vietnamese government give very clear guidelines and advice to those companies wishing to invest in mm. Vietnam, particularly for maybe infrastructure, mm. uh, because as you said in your presentation, one of your three priorities is, is the improvement of urban and uh, regional infrastructure. Um, to what extent do you give uh, clear guidance on the costs and the responsibilities of investors on uh, addressing the land acquisition and compensation processes uh, which can be up to 30% of a, an investment budget, uh, depending on where you are. If you're in an urban area, it, it's, the, you know, the cost may be higher. Um, and in relation to that, uh, also with any transboundary impacts uh, that might occur as a result of infrastructure investment, such as, for example, improving an energy network, improving road communications and connections, um, or uh, hydropower impacts on transboundary um, natural resources like the Mekong River or other um, natural. Okay. Right, sir. Okay. okay. I think it's one long question. Uh, long questions and many implications. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you uh, for your question. Uh, two issues. I think uh, for improve, uh, for land acquisitions and uh, I mean working with the foreign investors, one of the issues that we face difficulties is the land, uh, land use out and land ownership. And uh, in the last 20 years or so, until last year, we have to revise all the land law. And I think uh, by the end of last year, the uh, National Assembly, uh, we call National Assembly even here Parliament, has uh, passed the new law on land use. And I think uh, with this, we would open up a new possibilities of cooperation. And we provide very clear uh, guidances. The Ministry of uh, Natural Resources and uh, Environment would, and Land would uh, provide very clear guidance of the law for the foreign investors and as well as domestic investors to work on the issues. And I think uh, one of the book guidelines here uh, of the projects would also <coughs> provide you with a list of that. These are the books that are upstairs. Yeah, upstairs, yeah. yeah. Uh, the second issue is that uh, how we, why focusing on infrastructure, as I said to you, land, railway system, but energy is also very important for us. If the sustained economy to growth around 7%, then energy sector must be growth at around 14 to 15% per year. So that's why in the past we're focusing too much on hydropower. But now we have to diversify, uh, diversify it, because also the maximum we can do already we have done on hydropower. And so now we have to diversify using more renewable energy. For example, wind mill, we also cooperate with the UK, with uh, Denmark, with uh, US to build the wind mill and also solar. But that would be expensive. So that's why we're also working on uh, nuclear power. Yes. So we're starting to build nuclear power uh, from next year and would be completed by, 2000, uh, by 2022 or so. 
uh, do as the first power stations. I think uh, Scotland you have uh, nuclear power stations for many years already, and uh, UK also working with us in collaborations with other partners like Japan, etc. On the know-how on it, on trans uh, transnational hydropower. Uh, as a very good question that the problem with us is five countries is sharing the Mekong countries, Mekong, up from China to Myanmar to Laos to uh, Thailand, uh, Cambodia and then Vietnam. So currently there is a, uh, a plan uh, by Laos and Thailand and Cambodia to build uh, 11 dams on the main river, main stream of the uh, Mekong River. If that, uh, I mean, that uh, project is realized, then Mekong Delta of Vietnam would be completely running out of water. Yeah. All the water, uh, sea water would come into. And the Mekong that used to be, and now currently, the source of our rice production that exports to the world around 5 million tons per year would be in trouble. And you're the second largest rice producer in the world? Yes, the Maybe second the largest. First, first, second. Uh, sometimes first, yeah. sometimes second. <laughs> if uh, Thailand is uh, uh, reserving their rice, then we become the first. Right. And if <laughs> and sometimes exchange, but again, the price is a uh, problem. Mm. Who has another question to the Vice Minister? Yes. Uh, Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce. Um, I wanted to, you were talking about uh, natural resources and water and dams and hydro. Uh, I wanted to turn to energy and the production of oil and gas, and you've mentioned earlier the dispute uh, with China. But what opportunities do you foresee in future for joint ventures with uh, uh, operators um, outside of Vietnam to work with Vietnam to extract uh, natural resources? Uh, Clearly, you mean that uh, work with you to import over? No, to, to extract. To, uh, uh, extract in, uh, in yeah. Vietnam. Huh? Yeah. I think uh, the process of cooperation already is happening in the last 20 years or so. All along the continental shelves of Vietnam, I think uh, around 32 oil uh, and gas uh, exploration projects are going on in collaborations with uh, uh, previously with British Shell as well. But now she is going out. Uh, so we have with uh, ExxonMobil, we have uh, with uh, Indian, we have uh, with Russian, we have uh, with Can Canadian, etc. Coming to, I think, uh, big projects of oil and gas is coming from uh, the concern, concerns in the south, west of uh, our continent, uh, continental shelf providing this source of gas into the uh, gas uh, power stations in uh, Kanthe, as you see here, yeah, or Kamau. So I think uh, this is the project. We continue to work with others, uh, especially recently we worked with the Russians to explore other um, gas fields in the middle part of the country. I think this is the, the project and also uh, Russian can also provide us with gas as well for the for the for the, act, uh, for the production of uh, electricity in within the side country. We also working with other Arabian countries like uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, etc., to be up oil refinery, etc., along the coast uh, for uh, production. We we have a lot of also the PBN has here a list of projects that would want to cooperate with international companies, including UK, British, for oil and gas exploration. One of the problems for us, for, for example, for gas production of electricity, is now is the government still subsidized a lot on electricity. So the price of electricity is low. So that's the hindrances. Of our cooperation. So, but the government has a plan to increase or to uh, marketize or uh, have the market prices of the electricity. If that is completed, then it's 
much easier for us to cooperate with others in the production, using oil and gas for production of electricity. Sounds like you need to visit Aberdeen, probably. Yes, gentlemen there. Uh, my name is Peter Smith. Do you yeah. want to pass these to Angio? Uh, Your Excellency, I was very interested to hear what you're saying about the uh, ambitious uh, negotiations mm. on free trade agreements yes. and economic partnerships. Mm. Um, and just wanted, uh, as a drinks company, um, exporting to Vietnam, mm. and also we have a, a share in uh, the Hanoi Liquor Company um, in Vietnam. Just very interested to hear what you're saying about the ambition uh, to have tariff, customs tariffs uh, reduced or eliminated. And obviously that uh, depends on negotiations, but um, you, you just wanted to confirm, you're saying by the end of 2015, you, that there was a hope that that, that, could, that could move, because that, that's a, a very encouraging sign for a number of companies. Yes. You are exporting Scottish whiskey to A little bit. Yes, a lot Actually, of a lot. Vietnam already, <laughs> Vietnam a FTA. Lot. We still have a lot of Scottish uh, whiskies in Vietnam. The Angio is a very mm. big company. But again, I, I tell you, uh, we have not only FTA with, um, with the EU, which uh, UK is part member of that uh, pact. Uh, the negotiations is going on, but it's covering all areas. So I think uh, your, uh, the liquid uh, or uh, drinking uh, uh, spirits also includes in the in the pack of negotiations, and I think if it is completed, it's much easier for for businesses to work. And the Vietnamese are also a good uh, drinking uh, population. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm, we know you call, you. we call whiskey the water of life. Yes, water of life. Mm. Water is mm. water and water management is another very mm. important uh, mm. aspect of mm. the. Uh, Scottish economy. Mm. Diane, I wonder if you'd like to raise that as a question. Mm. My name's Diane Duncan. I work for one of uh, Scotland's two economic development agencies. So my, my area covers the very north of Scotland and the west of Scotland and 90 inhabited islands. Mm. Um, and the environment is, is hugely important mm. uh, for, for the Scottish economy. And indeed, our water is, is absolutely critical mm. for, the, for the delivery of superb whiskey from, mm. from Scotland. Really enjoyed your video. And uh, I must admit, it, it makes me want to go and visit and love yeah. the vibrancy and, and the young people. Mm. And one of the things that strikes me is that I, I wanted to know if, if you are putting safeguards in place so that the environment is protected, because mm. it struck me it was just so beautiful, mm. uh, lots of you know, bright, clean air, mm. uh, fresh water. Mm. Is that something that is a priority for you in, in your ministry? Yes, uh, in our strategy for economic development from 11 to 2020, uh, we not only set the target for growth and development and industrialization of the economies, but we also have to link to other important as aspects in the strategy of development. That is growth, sustainable growth in a company with protection of environment, and good social security policies for the disabled or uh, persons or people. So environment is one part of it. So that's why uh, in environment there are two aspects. One is that we, not only the issues that caused by our, by people, uh, by production, by living, access, like using cars or production, etc. But the other is to cope with the climate change as well. So both, both aspects we have to deal at the same time. Currently, we also set up a strategic partnership in the area of climate change and environment with uh, the Netherlands and with uh, Denmark. Uh, we also, one of the area in the UK, Vietnam strategic partnership is also that environment. And I hope that Jan, and your enterprise can come to us, not only in exploring the po possibility of cooperation, but we, the whole range that we need the technologies, etc., uh, in the areas to cope with both, as I said, uh, by climate change, by uh, and also by the human, I mean, cost 
environment problem to us. Mm. 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 No, we've got a question over here. We can mm. pass mm. that mic. Can we get that across here? Yeah, thank you. Sir. Mm. Your Excellency, Peter Bard from Arab. Um, we design pretty well anything to do with the built environment. Um, one uh, development, I think, of your industrialization policy is the migration of populations from the to the urban environment. And we've seen huge migrations in, in Asia and in related to development. Are you, um, as a government, looking at that strategically and planning centrally all of the infrastructure development that that, uh, that implies, or, or you're delegating that responsibility to provincial centres? Um, in the past, we have uh, the central government also provided guidances to, for the migrations within the economy to uh, to realize our strategy for economic developments. We need to reallocate the resources, but that would be, uh, uh, I mean, uh, in the process, it would help the market in uh, allocate the human resources in developments, especially in the central highlands, in the northwest of the economy, of uh, the country. Both areas that businesses don't want to come. Why? Because the infrastructure is not good. Uh, even though it's very beautiful. Uh, recently, I also, uh, two weeks, was in the central highlands, Tây Nguyên, in Vietnam, and I found out that really infrastructure was a problem, the climate also an issue. So that's why the government has to uh, bring people from, uh, for example, the Mekong Delta up to that central highland, or bring people from uh, uh, Red River uh, Delta to northwest area to, to uh, I mean, to develop those uh, provinces or areas and in the past I think looking back we see the lot of results but again in the new period we need to uh, give more authorities to the provinces so that they can decide their own uh, how they can uh, mobilize the support by uh, the market uh, incentive itself not by central plant command that we would bring people up to there and maybe not efficient. So now we need to have more, uh, let's say, market immigration of people by provinces to provide incentive. For example, in the Northwest, we would uh, provide the provincial or local authorities with credits so that they would use that credit to provide incentives to pull people to come to solve their own problem. That's much better. Mm. Uh, Anne Packard, you've partly answered my question, which was to do with national planning frameworks and climate change. And I wonder if you could also touch on the issue of climate change and the built and historic environment and the um, policies of your government on safeguarding the built environment cultural heritage and intangible heritage? I think um, you, uh, your questions have two aspects very, uh, very important to us. The first is the cultural heritage. Vietnam has a long history. We have a lot of cultural and historical heritage. And uh, in the past years, because due to the world legacy, etc., we got a lot of international support especially bilaterally with many countries, including UK also, to restore or renovate all the uh, uh, cultural or historical heritage, uh, heritages that were damaged by the war or by climate, etc. That was efficient, but still a lot of projects are going on. The second aspect is that the national plan for uh, climate change, coping with climate change. The government, as I said to you, one big part of the strategy for economic development from 11 to uh, 2020 is that uh, how to cope with climate change. Because we 
uh, realized that Vietnam is one of the five uh, countries that are most affected by climate change. If we don't do anything like this, in the next 100 years, Vietnam, in the southern part of Vietnam, will, will come back to the sea again because the water rise would come. So that's why we are now have a strategy working with, uh, especially with the Netherlands, to build up the uh, system of dams and dikes to protect uh, the southern part, especially Mexico uh, areas, to to cope with uh, sea rise water or transla uh, transnational water, uh, fresh water use through Mekong River. This is also one of the areas that we have to work uh, through the Mekong uh, Regional uh, International Commission and also directly bilaterally with Laos, Thai and other countries to I mean, maintain the sustainable usage of water through Mekong. One of the projects that we do, very big projects in our research projects on the impacts, as you mentioned, uh, the research projects of uh, the impacts of the building up 11 dams on the mainstream of Mekong River, on how it impacts on the life of the downstream countries. And if we have the whole picture, then we would uh, work on how to build each dam more efficiently for future development. Thank you. Mm. Perhaps we take two. Yes, gentlemen. Yeah. 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 Thank you for last semester, and I'm from Taiwan, China. Oh. Also, I have mm. to say I'm quite mm. regretful, regretful and disappointed mm. by the recent turmoil uh, mm. happened between our two nations mm. and three parties. But my question will be broader, not only mm. focus on the, the island conflict. Mm. My, my question is, um, what uh, how will Vietnam to evaluate U.S. rebalancing uh, policy in East Asia? Mm. And uh, secondly, uh, will Vietnam think or will Vietnam uh, feel that uh, China became China is now became becoming a more and more aggressive or more a more aggressive or more <laughs> active player in the region? Mm. And uh, in the future years, may, if we can expect that, that uh, the competition between the USA and China will be uh, more and more apparently in East Asia. And what will be Vietnam's role in this kind of a new situation? Thank you. Mm. Vietnam's role in interceding between the United States mm. and China, right? Yes. Mm. And Vietnam's position with regard to China. I think uh, the engagements of all major power in Asia Pacific and the Southeast Asia is the, the main trend that no one can reverse. Why? Because Asia-Pacific is the center of development. So that's why EU, India, Russia, all major economic powers have to engage in the region. Brazil also engaged in it. So I think this is the trend. Not only US, not only. The second is that the rise of China is also irreversible. Because it's too big, and its rise is certain. The issue for us is now that whether the U.S. re-engagement, I can say, or rebalancing, because the U.S. says that it has vested interest in Asia Pacific for centuries, uh, for hundreds of years now. When it rise and it came back, it came to Southeast Asia and came to Asia Pacific. So now it because of the war Vietnam added and the United States turns its attention to other areas. But now with the rise of Asia Pacific, they came back again. So I can say the re-engagements of the US, the engagements of other major powers in the region, we welcome all that facts on the two grounds. The first is that if you engage in Asia Pacific, in Southeast Asia, it must be a positive and constructive engagement. It means that if you engage in, you have to contribute to peace and stability and prosperity of the region. If you engage in and then you divide all countries within the region, you uh, stir up instability, etc. within the region, we don't welcome that. 
other ASEAN also don't welcome that action. So I think uh, this is the point. The third point I want to say is that uh, Vietnam, how Vietnam interests. Vietnam is a member of ASEAN. We are also in the same family of ASEAN. All ASEAN countries in the same position that we would engage all major powers in our region constructively. As long as these major powers provide stability, peace, stability, and work with us for common prosperity, then we will also welcome all. I think within ASEAN, as I said to you, I mean, we would contribute very hard for the ASEAN community by 2015. And then with the increased role of ASEAN in the regional architecture, I think we could be able to uh, calm down all the uh, ambition or issues that may uh, work against international law. Yes. Thank you, Vice Minister. Very, very impressed in the in, in all of the. the, the sir, sorry, I beg pardon. I am David Scott, and I am representing Glasgow Chamber of Commerce. Um, we uh, from from the presentation, it's quite clear that a lot has been done to transform your economy from from a command economy to uh, to, to one more similar to that which we would experience in, in, in Europe. I'm particularly interested in the rate of new business startups, and particularly amongst uh, the, the, the youngsters in, in Vietnam, so those leaving school who perhaps do not go on to university, are they going into business for themselves? And if so, are there mechanisms by which we could uh, look for um, ways of collaboration between uh, our young business startups here in Scotland uh, and those in Vietnam? Mm. I can say that uh, when we change the mode of uh, development from, uh, as I said, from centrally planned to market economy, it took many years, very hard for us. You have hundreds of years of building of the, the market economy, but for us only 30 years. It, it took time, but again, with the international experiences, support assistance, we did gain a lot of success in, in that process. I think um, with market economy status, even if like other industrialized countries within OECD, most of them have recognized Vietnam as market economy status. That's a good. But we have to do work ourselves. That's more important. We have to build up all the market and also the functioning and mechanisms to function it properly. That's the, the, the point that we are now focusing on. And uh, I'm glad, for example, some of the uh, think tanks recently is also working with the uh, office of Tony Blair uh, on the cooperation on the issue of how we can carry out perfect reforms of the financial sector how we can do it officially in the form of uh, reform of the state-owned enterprises, how we can uh, simplify the procedures for foreign investors to coming to Vietnam. And I think this, is, this project is going on starting from last year. And then if it goes, it opens up a lot of opportunities uh, and ideas for us to, to cooperate in the future. For youngsters, when they can engage in business, I can say that uh, now the private and uh, enterprises now occupy around 45% of our GDP. So provides about 45% of our GDP. And the process of setting up uh, business opportunity in Vietnam is very clear, open. We have really got the support from you. Your author. So setting up business is easy. But then now how you can work efficiently due to difficulties in the past two years. For example, each year around 100,000 uh, companies or enterprises were collect, uh, bankrupt. But again, we also have 60,000 or 70,000 new enterprises set up. So I think uh, this is a process in the market and all the young uh, students coming from abroad 
like UK, US, Australia, even my uh, daughter or something. She did. Uh, she does not want to join in the civil services or bureaucracy like in the past. They want to set up their own businesses to do. That's the entrepreneurship that can be nurtured in the future. I think it's good for the economy. Thank you, Senator. Mm -hmm. I know it's another question. Yes, yes, lady in the back. Hello, Laura Mackenzie Stewart from Creative Scotland. Mm -hmm. Your presentation gave a good indication of the areas of potential for commercial relationships. Um, but I'm interested to hear what the Ministry's thinking might be around the role and potential of uh, cultural diplomacy, mm. and in particular the scope for uh, exchanges and collaborations between artists and creative entrepreneurs. Mm. I think our ambassador here is uh, working a lot on uh, cultural and economic diplomacy. Uh, and he may also provide more details of view of how cooperation in cultural diplomacy and cultural relations between our two particular two countries. In our foreign policies, we place three pillars on our foreign policy, political security, uh, cultural diplomacy, and economic diplomacy. Three would be combined together, depends on different countries. But with Europeans, all three areas they have to carry now at the same time. Why? Because Europe and UK in particular is the center of civilization already. We have a lot of to exchange, not only in education, we have in cultural and uh, ethnic, etc. A lot of interactions uh, between the two continents and two countries in the past and now currently. So I think this is one of the areas that we can do, uh, like our embassies here, is that uh, each year we would have different uh, cultural activities to promote more understanding of Vietnamese in UK and Scotland and vice versa. Last year, for example, during the time of uh, 40th anniversary of our bilateral relations, a lot of UK British active cultural activities taking place throughout the country. And I think uh, it would enhance the UK uh, presence in Vietnam, not only for, for our mutual understanding and trust, but also for better cooperation in the business in the future as well. You take one more question and then we're going to break for tea, coffee, and people mm -hmm. have a chance to talk mm -hmm. to, to His Excellency. So, just one mm -hmm. more question. Mm -hmm. the back. Mm -hmm. I don't no. know. I think. No. Su Susanna Kerr, I'm just, I've, I'm just here as a frequent visitor to Vietnam. Oh. And I'm afraid I'm going to bring my question right down to a very low level. Yeah. Your <laughs> lovely film, um, mm. which highlighted some of the mm. great mm. Um, sites of Vietnam, mm. um, left out one thing, and mm. that was the motorbike. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a special speciality of Vietnam. It is a speciality <laughs> of Vietnam. And this this really is a bit more serious than that in a way because it does impact on the environment. Mm -hmm. And in the last four or five years that I've been going to Vietnam, I have seen an amazing increase mm -hmm. in the motorbikes. In particular, they are now riding on the pavements mm -hmm. everywhere, you know. Mm -hmm. So I just wondered if there was any policy for controlling the motorbike. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We want to control, but the manufacturers of motorbikes doesn't. No. <laughs> so uh, what we do is that, uh, yes, that's a uh, critical issue for us in the process of development. Uh, in the past, we uh, faced with the problems of uh, traffic jams, environments, etc. Because of the boom of the economy, every one family has at least two or three motorbikes. So that's why when you come to, as I said at the beginning, every time you go to Hanoi or any cities in Vietnam, motorbikes and people are so crowded that this is a problem for us. So what we do in the last few years is that uh, we have to expand the roads, build more uh, cross uh, bridges over the intersections, etc. And uh, in the last two years, it, it improved a lot. 
The third is that the government also plan to control, to reduce the number of motorbikes in the big cities. But we have to phase out, because if we do immediately, people would protest. Then it's, uh, it's, it's a problem for the government as well. So that's why we have to do it in plan, uh, in phase out, how to control and increase. And people, some say that uh, even motorbike is better than cars, because uh, cars, if you have traffic jams, you cannot go. But uh, motorbikes, you can still say, go on the pavements. <laughs> Come into other areas. <laughs> That's the flexibility of the Vietnamese. But I, I, I say again. <laughs> so on, on your behalf, I'd like you all to join together to thank His Excellency very much for his extremely interesting talk. Thank you. Sir. Thank you.